Section 5 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 5 The Pomegranate Seeds. Part 3. While she dwelt in the king's palace, Mother Ceres had been so continually occupied with taking care of the young prince that her heart was a little lightened of its grief for Proserpina. But now, having nothing else to busy herself about, she became just as wretched as before. At length, in her despair, she came to the dreadful resolution that not a stalk of grain, nor a blade of grass, not a potato, nor a turnip, nor any other vegetable that was good for man or beast to eat, should be suffered to grow until her daughter was restored. She even forbade the flowers to bloom, lest somebody's heart should be cheered by their beauty. Now as not so much as a head of asparagus ever presumed to poke itself out of the ground without the especial permission of Ceres, you may conceive what a terrible calamity had here befallen upon the earth. The husbandmen ploughed and planted as usual, but there lay the rich black furrows, all as barren as a desert of sand. The pastures looked as brown in the sweet month of June as ever they did in chill November. The rich man's broad acres and the cottager's small garden patch were equally blighted. Every little girl's flower bed showed nothing but dry stalks. The old people shook their white heads, and said that the earth had grown aged like themselves, and was no longer capable of wearing the warm smile of summer on its face. It was really piteous to see the poor, starving cattle and sheep, how they followed behind Ceres, lowing and bleating, as if their instinct taught them to expect help from her. And everybody that was acquainted with her power besought her to have mercy on the human race, and, at all events, to let the grass grow. But Mother Ceres, though naturally of an affectionate disposition, was now inexorable. Never, said she, if the earth is ever again to see any verdure, it must first grow along the path which my daughter will tread in coming back to me. Finally, as there seemed to be no other remedy, our old friend Quicksilver was sent post-haste to King Pluto, in hopes that he might be persuaded to undo the mischief he had done, and to set everything right again by giving up Proserpina. Quicksilver accordingly made the best of his way to the great gate, took a flying leap right over the three-headed mastiff, and stood at the door of the palace in an inconceivably short time. The servants knew him both by his face and garb, for his short cloak and his winged cap and shoes, and his snaky staff had often been seen thereabouts in times gone by. He requested to be shown immediately into the king's presence, and Pluto, who heard his voice from the top of the stairs, and who loved to recreate himself with Quicksilver's merry talk, called out to him to come up, and while they settled their business together, we must inquire what Proserpina has been doing ever since we saw her last. The child had declared, as you may remember, that she would not taste a mouthful of food as long as she should be compelled to remain in King Pluto's palace. How she contrived to maintain her resolution, and at the same time to keep herself tolerably plump and rosy, is more than I can explain. But some young ladies, I am given to understand, possess the faculty of living on air, and Proserpina seems to have possessed it too. At any rate, it was now six months since she left the outside of the earth, and not a morsel, so far as the attendants were able to testify, had yet passed between her teeth. This was the more creditable to Proserpina, inasmuch as King Pluto had caused her to be tempted day by day with all manner of sweetmeats and richly preserved fruits and delicacies of every sort, such as young people are generally most fond of. But her good mother had often told her of the hurtfulness of these things, and for that reason alone, if there had been no other, she would have resolutely refused to taste them. All this time, being of a cheerful and active disposition, the little damsel was not quite so unhappy as you may have supposed. The immense palace had a thousand rooms, and was full of beautiful and wonderful objects. There was a never-ceasing gloom, it is true, which half hid itself among the innumerable pillars, gliding before the child as she wandered among them, 
and treading stealthily behind her in the echo of her footsteps. Neither was all the dazzle of the precious stones which flamed with their own light worth one gleam of natural sunshine, nor could the most brilliant of the many-coloured gems which Proserpina had for playthings vie with the simple beauty of the flowers she used to gather. But still, wherever the girl went, among those gilded halls and chambers, it seemed as if she carried nature and sunshine along with her, and if she scattered dewy blossoms on her right hand and on her left. After Proserpina came, the palace was no longer the same abode of stately artifice and dismal magnificence that it had been before. The inhabitants all felt this, and King Pluto more than any of them. "'My own little Proserpina,' he used to say, "'I wish you could like me a little better. "'We gloomy and cloudy-natured persons "'have often as warm hearts at bottom "'as those of a more cheerful character. "'If you would only stay with me of your own accord, "'it would make me happier "'than the possession of a hundred such palaces as this.' "'Ah,' said Proserpina, "'you should have tried to make me like you "'before carrying me off, "'and the best thing you can do now "'is to let me go again.' "'Then I might remember you sometimes, "'and think that you were as kind as you knew how to be. "'Perhaps, too, one day or other, "'I might come back and pay you a visit.' "'No, no,' answered Pluto, with his gloomy smile. "'I will not trust you for that. "'You are too fond of living in the broad daylight "'and gathering flowers. "'What an idle and childish taste that is. "'Are not these gems which I have ordered to be dug for you, "'and which are richer than any in my crown?' "'Are they not prettier than a violet?' "'Not half so pretty,' said Proserpina, "'snatching the gems from Pluto's hand "'and flinging them to the other end of the hall. "'Oh, my sweet violet, shall I never see you again?' "'And then she burst into tears. "'But young people's tears have very little saltness or acidity in them "'and do not inflame the eyes so much as those of grown persons, "'so that it is not to be wondered at if, a few minutes afterward, Proserpina was sporting through the hall almost as merrily as she and the four sea-nymphs had sported along the edge of the surf-wave. King Pluto gazed after her, and wished that he too was a child. And little Proserpina, when she turned about and beheld this great king standing in his splendid hall, and looking so grand and so melancholy and so lonesome, was smitten with a kind of pity. She ran back to him, and, for the first time in all her life, put her small, soft hand in his. "'I love you a little,' whispered she, looking up in his face. "'Do you indeed, my dear child?' cried Pluto, bending his dark face down to kiss her. But Proserpina shrank away from the kiss, for, though his features were noble, they were very dusky and grim. "'Well, I have not deserved it of you, after keeping you a prisoner for so many months, and starving you besides.' "'Are you not terribly hungry? "'Is there nothing which I can get you to eat?' "'In asking this question, "'the king of the mines had a very cunning purpose. "'For, you will recollect, "'if Proserpina tasted a morsel of food in his dominions, "'she would never afterward be at liberty to quit them. "'No, indeed,' said Proserpina. "'Your head cook is always baking and stewing "'and roasting and rolling out paste "'and contriving one dish or another, "'which he imagines may be to my liking.' "'but he might just as well save himself the trouble, "'poor fat little man that he is. "'I have no appetite for anything in the world "'unless it were a slice of bread of my mother's own baking "'or a little fruit out of her garden.' "'When Pluto heard this, "'he began to see that he had mistaken the best method "'of tempting Proserpina to eat. "'The cook's made dishes and artificial dainties "'were not half so delicious in the good child's opinion "'as the simple fare to which Mother Ceres had accustomed her. Wondering that he had never thought of it before, the king now sent one of his trusty attendants with a large basket to get some of the finest and juiciest pears, peaches and plums which could anywhere be found in the upper world. Unfortunately, however, this was during the time when Ceres had forbidden any fruits or vegetables to grow, and, after seeking all over the earth, King Pluto's servant found only a single pomegranate, and that so dried up as to be not worth eating. Nevertheless, since there was no better to be had, he brought this dry, old, withered pomegranate home to the palace, put it on a magnificent golden salver, and carried it up to Proserpina. Now it happened, curiously enough, that just as the servant was bringing the pomegranate 
into the back door of the palace, our friend Quicksilver had gone up the front steps on his errand to get Proserpina away from King Pluto. As soon as Proserpina saw the pomegranate on the golden salver, she told the servant he had better take it away again. "'I shall not touch it, I assure you,' said she. "'If I were ever so hungry, I should never think of eating such a miserable dry pomegranate as that.' "'It is the only one in the world,' said the servant. "'He set down the golden salver, with the wizened pomegranate upon it, and left the room. "'When he was gone, Proserpina could not help coming close to the table, "'and looking at this poor specimen of dried fruit with a great deal of eagerness. "'For, to say the truth, on seeing something that suited her taste, "'she felt all the six months' appetite taking possession of her at once. "'To be sure, it was a very wretched-looking pomegranate,' and seemed to have no more juice in it than an oyster-shell. But there was no choice of such things in King Pluto's palace. This was the first fruit she had seen there, and the last she was ever likely to see, and unless she ate it up immediately, it would grow drier than it already was, and be wholly unfit to eat. At least I may smell it, thought Proserpina. So she took up the pomegranate and applied it to her nose, and, somehow or other, being in such close neighbourhood to her mouth, the fruit found its way into that little red cave. Dear me, what an everlasting pity! Before Proserpina knew what she was about, her teeth had actually bitten it of their own accord. Just as this fatal deed was done, the door of the apartment opened, and in came King Pluto, followed by Quicksilver, who had been urging him to let his little prisoner go. At the first noise of their entrance, Proserpina withdrew the pomegranate from her mouth, but Quicksilver, whose eyes were very keen and his wits the sharpest that ever anybody had, perceived that the child was a little confused, and seeing the empty salver, he suspected that she had been taking a sly nibble of something or other. As for honest Pluto, he never guessed at the secret. "'My little Proserpina,' said the king, sitting down, and affectionately drawing her between his knees, here is Quicksilver, who tells me that a great many misfortunes have befallen innocent people on account of my detaining you in my dominions. To confess the truth, I myself had already reflected that it was an unjustifiable act to take you away from your good mother. But then you must consider, my dear child, that this vast palace is apt to be gloomy, although the precious stones certainly shine very bright, and that I am not of the most cheerful disposition and that therefore it was a natural thing enough to seek for the society of some merrier creature than myself. I hoped you would take my crown for a plaything, and me, ah, you laugh, naughty Proserpina, me, grim as I am, for a playmate. It was a silly expectation. Not so extremely silly, whispered Proserpina. You have really amused me very much sometimes. Thank you, said King Pluto rather dryly. "'but I can see, plainly enough, that you think my palace a dusky prison, "'and me the iron-hearted keeper of it. "'And an iron heart I should surely have "'if I could detain you here any longer, my poor child, "'when it is now six months since you tasted food. "'I give you your liberty. "'Go with Quicksilver. "'Hasten home to your dear mother. "'Now, although you may not have supposed it, "'Proserpina found it impossible to take leave of poor King Pluto, without some regrets, and a good deal of compunction for not telling him about the pomegranate. She even shed a tear or two, thinking how lonely and cheerless the great palace would seem to him, with all its ugly glare of artificial light, after she herself, his one little ray of natural sunshine, whom he had stolen to be sure, but only because he valued her so much, after she should have departed. I know not how many kind things she might have said to the disconsolate king of the mines, had not Quicksilver hurried her away. "'Come along quickly,' whispered he in her ear, "'or his majesty may change his royal mind, "'and take care, above all things, "'that you say nothing of what was brought you on the golden salver.' In a very short time they had passed the great gateway, leaving the three-headed Cerberus barking and yelping and growling with threefold din behind them and emerged upon the surface of the earth. It was delightful to behold, as Proserpina hastened along, how the path grew verdant behind and on either side of her. Wherever she set her blessed foot, there was at once a dewy flower. 
The violets gushed up along the wayside. The grass and the grain began to sprout with tenfold vigour and luxuriance, to make up for the dreary months that had been wasted in barrenness. The starved cattle immediately set to work grazing, after their long fast, and ate enormously all day, and got up at midnight to eat more. But I can assure you, it was a busy time of year with the farmers, when they found the summer coming upon them with such a rush. Nor must I forget to say that all the birds in the whole world hopped upon the newly blossoming trees, and sang together in a prodigious ecstasy of joy. Mother Ceres had returned to her deserted home, and was sitting disconsolately on the doorstep, with her torch burning in her hand. She had been idly watching the flame for some moments past, when all at once it flickered and went out. "'What does this mean?' thought she. "'It was an enchanted torch, and should have kept burning till my child came back.' Lifting her eyes, she was surprised to see a sudden verdure flashing over the brown and barren fields, exactly as you may have observed a golden hue gleaming far and wide across the landscape from the just-risen sun. "'Does the earth disobey me?' exclaimed Mother Ceres indignantly. "'Does it presume to be green when I have bidden it be barren, until my daughter shall be restored to my arms?' "'Then open your arms, dear mother,' cried a well-known voice, "'and take your little daughter into them.' and Proserpina came running, and flung herself upon her mother's bosom. Their mutual transport is not to be described. The grief of their separation had caused both of them to shed a great many tears, and now they shed a great many more, because their joy could not so well express itself in any other way. When their hearts had grown a little more quiet, Mother Ceres looked anxiously at Proserpina. "'My child,' said she, "'did you taste any food while you were in King Pluto's palace?' "'Dearest mother,' answered Proserpina, "'I will tell you the whole truth. "'Until this very morning not a morsel of food has passed my lips. "'But today they brought me a pomegranate, "'a very dry one it was, and all shriveled up, "'till there was little left of it but seeds and skin. "'And having seen no fruit for so long a time, "'and being faint with hunger, I was tempted just to bite it. "'The instant I tasted it, King Pluto and Quicksilver came into the room.' I had not swallowed a morsel, but, dear mother, I hope it was no harm, but six of the pomegranate seeds, I am afraid, remained in my mouth. Ah, unfortunate child, and miserable me, exclaimed Ceres, for each of those six pomegranate seeds you must spend one month of every year in King Pluto's palace. You are but half restored to your mother, only six months with me, and six with that good-for-nothing King of Darkness. "'Do not speak so harshly of poor King Pluto,' said Proserpina, kissing her mother. "'He has some very good qualities, and I really think I can bear to spend six months in his palace, "'if he will only let me spend the other six with you. "'He certainly did very wrong to carry me off, but then, as he says, "'it was but a dismal sort of life for him, to live in that great gloomy place all alone, "'and it has made a wonderful change in his spirits to have a little girl to run upstairs and down.' There is some comfort in making him so happy, and so, upon the whole, dearest mother, let us be thankful that he is not to keep me the whole year round. End of section 5